Welcome back everyone to Update X, where I tell you what's been going on in the crazy world of video games over the past week, upload every Monday morning on YouTube and podcast platforms like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I am your host, Brandon Reshitar, at the only Rush on Twitter and basically everywhere else. Today's update 5.4 from May 25th, 2020, which includes Sony talking about revealing the PS5 launch lineup soon, the next Call of Duty Black Ops title, Apex being around for the next 10 years, and so much more. Let's get into it. We're going to start with Sony saying its plans to reveal a compelling PS5 games lineup soon. I'm getting the info from Tom Ivan at Video Games Chronicle. Company president and CEO Kenichiro Yoshida announced the plan during Sony's corporate strategy meeting on Tuesday. He says, quote, Games for the PS5 that deliver this new game experience are being made by both first- and third-party developers, and we plan to introduce a compelling lineup of titles soon. Commenting on the impact of the coronavirus last week, Sony said major problems have not arisen in the game's software development pipeline for Sony's own first-party studios or its partner studios. It also said it's too soon to judge its PS5 marketing campaign in response to criticism about its promotional activities lagging behind Microsoft's Xbox Series X product reveals. Because... Uh, Microsoft has been really good about giving us info on a regular basis. Granted, I don't want to say they're doing quantity more than quality because they are giving us quality info with a couple flops here and there. And on a related note, Sony says its relationship with Microsoft is deepening following a cloud tech deal. I'm getting this info from Andy Robinson at Video Games Chronicle. Microsoft said Sony announced a strategic partnership in May 2019 which will result in the PlayStation Maker using Microsoft Azure data centers for cloud gaming and content streaming services. As part of the deal, Sony and Microsoft will also explore collaboration in the areas of semiconductors and AI. Speaking during an earnings call on Tuesday, this is transcribed by VGC, Sony's Executive Vice President Toru Katsumoto said he anticipates Sony will develop a very strong partnership with Microsoft in the mid to long term. He says, quote, since last year, we've been discussing this collaboration with Microsoft. In addition to cloud streaming games, there are semiconductors, consumer electronics, and remote solutions. In these areas, we are proceeding with our discussions. Microsoft Azure has splendid cloud technologies, and they have given us clear explanations so far. Each side has its merits, and it seems that our mutual understanding is deepening after discussions. In a follow-up interview, Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella claimed the cloud gaming deal was all driven by Sony. He said they looked at who are all their partners that they can trust. In fact, it turns out, even though we've competed, we've also partnered. So, enough of the console wars, Xbox versus PlayStation, they're working together to make gaming a better experience for everybody. They're combining uh, servers and some technology, it looks like, and one thing they were talking about was how packed the servers are in the evening slash nighttime hours of the day and how they can improve that so there are less connectivity issues and server issues when people are playing online. So it's all good news. Uh, two big guys in the industry playing together, so that's nice to see. And the next story we've got, Valorant gets a full release date. And this is from Andrew Webster at The Verge. Riot's hotly anticipated tactical shooter Valorant is launching on June 2nd. The game, which has been in a closed beta since April, will be available on PC for free and across the majority of regions worldwide, according to Riot. As part of the launch, the beta will end on May 28th. Valorant, a 5v5 game that blends elements of Overwatch and Counter-Strike, is the first major release from Riot since League of Legends, which debuted a decade ago. It has dominated Twitch since the beta started, thanks in large part to a unique setup where players could only get into the beta by watching top streamers play. The result was a record-breaking day on Amazon's streaming platform. Likewise, despite not being widely available, Valorant has already had an impact on the esports scene, with multiple players moving over from other games. For those who managed to get into the beta, Riot says their progression will be reset and they will start fresh, progressing from the same starting line as they compete with players around the world. The developer also says that it's planning to add new modes, characters, and maps shortly after launch. And it will be deploying new servers in Atlanta, Dallas, London, Madrid, and Warsaw to 
to keep up with the influx of new players. So getting a release date a lot sooner than I thought it would because recently games that go into beta just stay in beta like forever. I think Fortnite still says beta when you start it up, but I don't play that either. I tried Valorant once when I got the beta, um, but I've also never played Counter-Strike, and I'm just not a fan of your weapon losing all accuracy as soon as you start moving. I just don't... I've never played a game like that, and I don't enjoy that much, so I played like two matches and that was it. And the next story, Assassin's Creed Valhalla is actually going to be bigger than previous games in the franchise, or at least that's the newest claim. I'm getting this from Alex Avard at Games Radar. The Assassin's Creed Valhalla map could well be the biggest in the franchise history, according to new comments from Ubisoft producer Julian Laferriere. In an interview with YouTuber Julian Chiez, this is translated via Reddit, Laferriere said that the map size of Assassin's Creed Valhalla is bigger than 2018's Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which itself represented the largest sandbox in the open world series had seen so far, coming in at around 90 square miles of playable terrain. And here's a quote saying, I would actually say in terms of range, Valhalla is probably a bit larger than Assassin's Creed Odyssey, said Laferriere. I do not have the exact figures at this stage, but we have not only created the whole country, which is in this case England, but also too a good portion of Norway. I feel like they there's no way they created the entire country of England. They have to be... I don't know, the wording has to be off a little bit on that, because that's... A lot of space. There are other secret worlds, which I cannot speak about today, which contributed to the size of the game. It's not a small game, it is a game which is clearly ambitious, which will offer many hours of gameplay for the players. So this is all kind of confusing now, because previously, Ubisoft Montreal's head of communications for the, for the Middle East, Malek Tafaha, said Valhalla will be, his quote, was neither the longest nor the biggest game in the series. And again, that was a tweet that was translated from Arabic, and the new statement of the game being bigger is also translated from an interview. So either some translation was wrong in one or both of these, or these two Ubisoft employees both have a different view of the size of the game. But between not seeing gameplay when we were supposed to, and now conflicting statements on the size of the game, I really am not believing anything I hear about it at this point until the game comes out this holiday. And going on from that, we've got Ghost of Tsushima will be over 40 to 50 hours, uh, director confirms. This is from Shibu at techplusgame.com. First off, those numbers would have been a safe assumption anyway, given the type of this game. But take these claims with a grain of salt, because the game director didn't specifically say those numbers. It was an interview where it was, you can kind of assume that that's what he meant, but I'll go over the details. Uh, Nate Fox, the game's director, had an interview with Portuguese website Voxel. The director has confirmed that the approach to the game can be freely decided by the players on how they choose to proceed with the story, and how they can entertain themselves with all the secondary missions proposed in the game. Quote, It is a difficult question to answer, because the world is a large space with several isolated side stories, Fox said. We did several tests with people playing about six and a half hours a day, and the results were very different. Many did not finish the main story because they were busy exploring other aspects of the game. When asked if the players could take 30, 40, 50, or more hours if they devoted themselves to optional activities and less to the specific mainline story only, Fox replied, yes, absolutely, but I would highly recommend that everyone get off the main route and get lost in the island of Tsushima, since there's a lot to discover there. After all, Sucker Punch has already confirmed that it was inspired by games like The Legend of Zelda, so it seems more than reasonable to expect the rich open world to be discovered. And a side piece of information that came up this week, uh, your horse can't be hurt or killed in the game, but it can get scared and run away. Kind of a random piece of information, but it came up publicly, so somebody was wondering. Uh, creative director J Jason Connell said in an, inter in an interview with US Gamer, your horse is not going to die. Your horse will get scared and run away. You may not be able to bring them back for a brief, brief moment, but nobody's going to, in combat, in gameplay, kill your horse. And even more Ghost of Tsushima news this week. Uh, the devs discussed challenging combat and incredibly difficult samurai fights. 
and this info is from Jonathan Dornbush at IGN. Ghost of Tsushima's recent State of Play showcase offered a brief look at how combat will work in the upcoming open world PS4 adventure from Sucker Punch, but some new details have revealed just how challenging the combat is meant to be. Speaking with IGN Nordic, Ghost of Tsushima game director Nate Fox explained how Jin, though a trained and skilled samurai, can be felled by a few hits. Players won't just be able to go swords blazing into an encampment and take out a dozen foes. Quote, we are trying to make a grounded game in that sense, so a couple blows from the enemy will kill you, Fox said. The game is very challenging. We have three words to describe the combat. Mud, blood, and steel. We absolutely honor the lethality of the sword. We watched samurai movies and people go down with one or two strikes. And that is embedded inside of the combat. Beating the Mongols in battle will be hard, but it's that challenge that makes it feel alive and the victory rewarding. You can't just run into a camp and fight five people at the same time. You will get overwhelmed and die. There can be a lot of enemies around you, and you'll have to start using some of those ghost tactics to start augmenting your playstyle because otherwise, seven or eight guys around you might be too much for a samurai to handle. That's what Connell told them. For those looking for extra challenge, though, they can turn to what Fox described as duels against other expert fighters. Quote, one thing we didn't show at State of Play, which I wish we had, was that the game features duels against other expert swordsmen. This is classic samurai stuff. Those fights are incredibly difficult, and they're driven from personality and get solved in the most cinematic way possible. Which is also true to fantasy. You need to study your opponent and understand how they attack in order to win, he explained. We also have an answer to a lingering question from the State of Play Showcase's combat section, namely what exactly the heads-up display meant for Tsushima's gameplay. So the red bar is health, the golden spheres are Jin's resolve. He uses these to regain a little bit of health. Also, it's his grit to perform his most devastating attacks. These attacks drain him a little bit, so you have to make a tactical decision if you'd rather heal or really bring the fight, Fox told GameSpot. And Jason Connell, the creative director, did confirm in an interview with the Washington Post that the game will have difficulty options. So them talking about how the combat is meant to be challenging, you can still tone the difficulty down a bit, or you can scale it up if you want to. If you want to. So it's not going to be incredibly punishing to people who just want to casually play the game and just experience the story that way. And I think, depending on the difficulty you choose, of course, this may force players to use more of the ghost more of the ghost tactics, even if they were planning on mainly using samurai tactics. Such an interesting way to force players to experience both sides of the combat. Granted, there are going to be people who strictly use ghost tactics because they just like stealth games. And the next story, we've got Black Ops Cold War is reportedly the next Call of Duty, with a reveal coming soon. Getting this info from Alessandro Barbosa at GameSpot. As has become tradition with the annual Call of Duty releases, this year's game has apparently leaked ahead of its official announcement. While Activision has already confirmed a new Call of Duty is coming this year, it hasn't shared any details whatsoever. However, according to a tweet that has since been corroborated by Eurogamer, this year's game will be called Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War, signaling both a return, the popular subseries, and a shift in naming convention for it. So, since the Black Ops games have just been Black Ops, and then Black Ops 2, 3, and 4, now they're just adding another term on the back end of it instead of saying Black Ops 5. And... It would shift the Call of Duty series from its futuristic setting, ditching the advanced weaponry for something more grounded in an actual historical time period. It's unclear if any familiar faces will return. The Black Ops Cold War name first appeared on Twitter by leaker Okami13, and Eurogamer has since reported it's heard the same news from its sources. This means that, much like 2019's Call of Duty Modern Warfare, developer Treyarch is going back to where Call of Duty Black Ops started, a stark change from the future-based warfare the Black Ops series traded in with its third and fourth installments. The Cold War setting has already been teased in Call of Duty Warzone, with reported plans for the Battle Royale to eventually reveal the game in its entirety. Players have found a Cold War spy plane by glitching through walls, and the reveal might have tied on into the ongoing mystery behind the many vault doors in Warzone currently. 
So a bunch of people have been speculating for the past, I want to say, year about the next Black Ops or Black Ops 5, how they referred to it before. But a little bit more info now. And I haven't been playing Warzone a lot recently, but um, apparently they are leading into a Black Ops Cold War reveal in Warzone with the bunkers and stuff like that. I did see some videos of some people getting inside the bunkers recently. and But all I saw so far was just a bunch of loot crates in there, and it wasn't really anything other than the spy plane they were talking about. And the next story we've got the Mafia Trilogy update. And I'm getting this info from Matt Wales at Eurogamer. As you might well imagine, the Mafia Trilogy consists of three games in total, with Mafia, Mafia 2, and Mafia 3 all arriving in Definitive Edition form. What this means in practice, however, varies quite considerably depending on the game. Mafia Definitive Edition, for instance, is a complete ground-up remake of the 2002 open-world mobster game. It uses a new game engine, features an updated script, and comes complete with additional cutscenes, plus all new gameplay sequences and features. It's teased in the trailer, and 2K says it'll reveal more later this year. As for Mafia 2 Definitive Edition, it's a remaster rather than a full-on remake, promising a version of post-World War II Empire Bay in 4K-compatible graphical detail. The Definitive Edition, if you're wondering how it plans to earn its title, includes the base game, all three Mafia 2 campaign add-ons, plus all clothing and vehicle packs. Lastly is Mafia 3 Definitive Edition, which, unsurprisingly, given the, given, uh, given the original game's relatively recent release in 2016, appears to feature at the least in the way of spit and polish. The first thing you'll likely want to know is that all three games will be available to purchase individually. The definitive editions of Mafia 2 and 3 cost $30 a piece and released today, May 19th, so this is an old post, on Xbox One, PlayStation 4, and PC. The Uber Enhanced Mafia Definitive Edition, meanwhile, arrives on the 28th of August and costs $40. Alternatively, you can opt for the Mafia Trilogy Bundle, giving you access to all three titles as they release. That bundle is $60. The Steam version is available to pre-order at a 10% discount through Green Man Gaming right now. Uh, it was when I was looking this up. I'm not sure if it's still 10% off on that uh, Green Man Gaming thing. And the next piece of info about it I'm getting from Stephen Petit at GameSpot. By pre-ordering Mafia Definitive Edition, you'll get the Chicago Outfit bonus pack, and you also get that if you get the Trilogy Bundle, so I don't think you have to pre-order it to get that. And you'll get bonus protagonist outfits and vehicles for each Definitive Edition you own, and you can use those bonuses in any of the three games. Also, linking your free 2K account to your platform of choice unlocks some more bonus content. And the next story, we've got The Last of Us Part 2. You likely won't see everything in one playthrough. This is from Jonathan Dornbush at IGN. Naughty Dog has discussed The Last of Us Part 2's ambitious scope for some time now, but a new look at the game has teased that the adventure is so big, players may not experience some story and gameplay elements on a single playthrough. In the latest episode of PlayStation's multi-part look at The Last of Us Part 2, Members of the development team discuss how Naughty Dog's biggest game ever has scripted sequences players may miss. Quote, in this game, we've gone so far in making the level design open that there are actually entire story moments, entire combat encounters, full scripted sequences that you may completely miss. The Last of Us Part II co-director Anthony Newman said in the latest look at the sequel. And there are things that we feel like, even though a portion of our player base may never see these things, the fact that when you do encounter them, you feel like you discovered them. It lends them this charm and this magic I think is unique to games. That this happened to me because of what I did in the place I explored to. Director Neil Druckmann previously spoke to IGN about the scope of The Last of Us Part II's world, saying, depending on where you are with the story, we might open things up significantly and say, here are some optional things you can go explore, some side stories, or you can go directly next to where you're meant to go but that a big goal for the team was not to simply pad out the experience. Quote, it's not padded. It has that pacing of the first game, he told us at the time. The latest look at the sequel also offered some more details about the upgrade system. Returning to The Last of Us Part Two is the ability to modify weapons and upgrade the character's skills. But Newman explained that to exemplify the idea that the characters and players have to live with their choices, 
you won't be able to upgrade everything in one go. Quote, we put a much stronger emphasis on the importance of the choices you make in the long term for your character, Newman said. Through the weapon upgrade system, through the player upgrade system, there aren't enough resources in a single playthrough to fully upgrade your character. The choices that you make, you're going to have to live with, and we wanted to make sure that all the choices that you made had a really noticeable and tangible impact on the way that you play. Whether this means any sort of new game plus mode will be included from the jump or introduced later is not stated, but it sounds like players will have to play through The Last of Us Part II's journey multiple times to experience the full skill trees. So, I think, and I don't think I'm alone in uh, this theory or this thought about this, I don't think this is the type of game where New Game Plus can really work that well, because I don't think they would restrict your amount of resources to upgrade your skill tree that much to the point where you would need a New Game Plus. I would assume, and say for, for argument's sake, you have three different branches of the skill tree to go down. I'm assuming you can get like one and a half to two full branches upgraded before you run out of resources in the game. I don't think it would be like you can only fully upgrade one branch of the skill tree in one playthrough. So I don't think a new game plus mode would really be necessary. I mean, they could do it by all means, but I don't feel like it would be the best fit for this type of game. And the next story, we've got the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater remasters won't have microtransactions at launch. So Pro Skater 1 and 2 remasters won't have them at launch, but they could arrive later down the line if fans demanded more content. Speaking to GameSpot, Vicarious Visions boss Jen O'Neill told the outlet, everything that you see at launch is going to be unlocked with gameplay. We're not planning on having a monetization at launch. Let's be clear, that doesn't seem to mean that Vicarious Visions specifically intends to add microtransactions later down the line for the sake of it. GameSpot appears to paraphrase O'Neill, saying that they would only arrive if there was a fan demand for extra in-game content. So yes, people are probably going to want more content from that game, uh, because fans of the game just are going to want to spend as much time as they can in that world. But at the same time, I really don't think anybody's going to be going to Vicarious Visions and being like, we want to pay more money for this game than we already did. So realistically, I don't see people demanding microtransactions, but I don't know, maybe more content. Some people would obviously pay for it, but we'll see what happens with that. And the next story, we've got Sony claiming the PS5 is 100 times faster than the PS4, thanks to its speedy SSD. It might sound hard to believe, but Sony has said the PS5 is 100 times faster than the PS4 because of the console's custom SSD hard drive. When asked about the PlayStation 5's speed compared to its current-gen console at a corporate strategy meeting, Sony made the bullish claim that PS5 will revolutionize the game experience for users. Sony CEO Kenichiro Yoshida added that the PS5's custom-built SSD, which is faster than the SSD in the Xbox Series X, will enable processing speeds that dwarf those found on PlayStation 4. Quote, In order to further enhance the sense of immersion in games, we expect to improve not just the resolution, but the speed of games, the Sony document reads. For example, through a custom-designed high-speed SSD, we plan to realize game data processing speeds that are approximately 100 times faster than PS4. Game load times should be much shorter, and players should be able to move through immense game worlds in almost an instant. It's important to note the word should is used a couple times, but there's no denying that the PS5's solid state drive is blazing fast and considerably more capable than the PS4's aging mechanical hard drive. Sony has been championing its SSD technology for a while now, and first showed off what its next generation hardware was capable of in a Spider-Man PS4 comparison demo which showed off how the entire world could be streamed instantly and without slowing down. The SSD should also eliminate load times, which have become an issue in game worlds and have continued to increase. So, if anyone's bought any new games in the past year, load times have been absolutely atrocious. Uh, a specific, ex specific example with Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, I think it's better than what it was when it launched. But at launch, when you died and had to respawn at the last meditation point, even if the meditation point was not far back from you at all, people would see 45 seconds to a minute of sitting on a loading screen before they could respawn, which was a huge pain. 
and continuing with the article, it seems that the PS5's SSD is going down well with developers too, as Epic Games recently expressed its appreciation for the new storage system and showed off a short demo of what players can expect to see from Sony's next-gen system. If you were to be cynical, it's easy to see why Sony is pushing its SSD tech so hard. On paper, the PS5 comes out with only one win when stacked up against the Xbox Series X, and that's the hard drive speeds. Everywhere else though, from the power to the GPU and the CPU clock speed, the Xbox Series X takes the win. So, a bold statement from Sony, I mean, not incredibly bold because 100 times faster than the PS4 isn't too crazy when you think, one, it's a next-gen jump, and two, it's SSD versus a normal hard drive, so there is going to be, huge, be a huge jump there. But next-gen has been talked up a lot recently between this 100 times faster statement and last week I talked about Phil Spencer saying this gen to next gen's jump will be similar to 2D to 3D jump, which was another huge statement, but that could also be a little bit subjective depending on who you talk to. But next gen's going to be huge. Maybe not immediately, but the next 5 to 10 years of games is going to see some incredible increases in quality. And the next story we've got, Respawn opens a new studio to focus on the future of Apex Legends. This is not the same as the studio I talked about last week. That was a studio formed by former members of Respawn that are making their own new games. So this info is from Austin Wood at GamesRadar. Apex Legends developer Respawn Entertainment has opened a new studio in Vancouver, Canada to focus on the future of its hit free-to-play battle royale. Quote, rather than list out the things we want to get done, and therefore what roles we need, we started off with, we know what we want to build, or we know we want to build Apex, and Apex has a huge opportunity to evolve in the future, being a live service game. Team director Steven Ferreira told Games Industry, and so what we started with, and sorry, and so we started with who was passionate about making Apex, and we built a team around strong individuals as opposed to a project plan that you would conventionally start off a project around. At Respawn, we've already got a lot of innovations underway, adds the game director Chad Grenier. The trouble is, we can't do all of the innovations we want. There are just too many. How do you choose which ones to run with and which ones are best for the game? And building a team in Vancouver is only going to help us bring more to the game. The new Vancouver studio will be dedicated to updates and maintenance for Apex Legends, but Respawn COO Dusty Welch stressed that the studio isn't limited to the Battle Royale. We love to dabble, he told Games Industry. Studio head Vince Zampella loves to dabble in all kinds of projects. His taste for game making is not just in shooters. But look, you've got Star Wars out there, that's a huge passion for Vince and I, and we love all kinds of different games, and we'll continue to think about ways to expand. So this is great news for Apex fans. They've already been putting in a good amount of new content in it over the past like year and change. And this will only increase the amount and hopefully the quality of new content moving forward. And an interesting addition to this story, Apex apparently has a 10-year run planned. So I'm getting this part from Joseph Yaden at PlayStation Lifestyle. Despite a decline in its player base since February 2019, Apex has still garnered success with more than 8 million players weekly. The publisher believes that they can get at least 10 years out of Apex Legends. EA CFO Blake Jorgensen said, We think about this as almost like an annual title. We will continue to innovate that game and evolve that game over time, and I believe that we have a 10-year run ahead of us for it, if not more. There's so much potential and ways to change the game over time and add to that game. We think that there's just huge potential in that, and that's how we're managing it. So, again, Apex is here to stay from the looks of it. Uh, then Respawn putting money into a brand new studio specifically to focus on Apex Legends. Granted, he said not only to focus on Apex Legends, but that was the initial push for the new studio. So that'll be good to see what they do in the future with Apex Legends. And as for the news in this episode, that's it. And there's a new segment I'm going to try and do every week where I go over any kind of gaming events, like when I go over like E3 time frame stuff, probably next episode or the episode after that. Uh, This coming week, there are no events happening, but I'm going to start to include that in future episodes. And going on to gaming deals, new games coming to Xbox Game Pass, 
Alan Wake, and Cities Skylines joined Game Pass last Thursday for Xbox and PC. Minecraft Dungeons will be on Game Pass when it launches May 26th for Xbox and PC. And Plebe Quest The Crusades, uh, the date just says May for that one, and that's for PC. And today, May 25th, is the last day of the ID at Xbox sale, with up to 75% off games like Firewatch and Kentucky Route Zero. And it's also the last day for the Super Saver sale, with up to 80% off games like A Way Out and The Division 2. It's also the last day for the Focus Publisher sale, with up to 80% off Xbox games like World War Z, SnowRunner, and Greedfall. PlayStation still has their extended play sale, with what looks like up to 80% off a variety of games, like Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, Crash Team Racing, Assassin's Creed Odyssey Gold Edition, Borderlands 3 Super Deluxe Edition, DayZ, The Batman Arkham Collection, and a ton more. That sale is going on through May 28th. PlayStation also has a weekend offer sale. The prices for these go through May 26th, which isn't technically the weekend anymore, but cheaper games for another couple days. That sale is up to 50% off games like One Piece Pirate Warriors 4, Star Wars, Jedi Knight, Jedi Academy, and more. PlayStation still has a Games Under $15 section where you can find what games are on sale for under $15. And PlayStation's deal of the week for last week, which runs through May 27th, is 34% off the base or digital deluxe edition of Neo 2. Nintendo has a deal on Sonic the Hedgehog games that ends the morning of May 26th, with sales on games like Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games Tokyo 2020, Sega Ages Sonic the Hedgehog, Sonic Forces, and more. A lot of Nintendo's deals end today, of course, because why not? Uh, Nintendo's anime game sale ends the morning of May 26th. Cannibal Cuisine is 25% off through May 27th. And Nintendo's Annapurna Interactive Publisher sale is going through May 28th, with sales on all of their games like Telling Lies and What Remains of Edith Finch. And a bunch of other deals, as always, for Nintendo. And again, I post the deals in between episodes on Twitter at UpdateXShow, since the deals like to end the day my episodes go up. And going on to the past week and next week releases via Metacritic, Mafia 2 and Mafia 3 Definitive Editions individually released May 19th, along with the trilogy you can purchase, which gets you the Mafia 1 remake when that releases on August 28th. That's for PS4, Xbox One, and PC. The Wonderful 101 Remastered released... Uh, May 19th for PS4, Switch, and PC. Five Nights at Freddy's Help Wanted, released May 21st for Switch. Journey to the Savage Planet, released May 21st for Switch. Total War Warhammer 2, The Warden and the Punch, released May 21st for PC. What the Golf, released May 21st for Switch. White Boy's Wit Attitude, The Pursuit of Money, <laughs> released May 22nd for PS4. I'm going to check that one out later because I like the name. Uh, Dragon Ball Fighter Z Ultra Instinct Goku, released May 22nd for PS4, Xbox One, and PC. Saints Row the Third Remastered, released May 22nd for PS4, Xbox One, and PC. Man Eater, released May 22nd for PS4, Xbox One, Switch, and PC. And going on to the re- releases for the next week, Minecraft Dungeons released, releases May 26th for Xbox One, PC, Switch, and PS4. If you have Xbox Game Pass, you get that for free. Mortal Kombat 11 Aftermath releases May 26th for Xbox One, Switch, PS4, and PC. The Elder Scrolls Online Greymore releases May 26th for PC. Atomic Ops releases May 28th for Switch, Xbox One, and PS4. May 29th, there is a lot coming to Switch, so I'm just going to go over a bunch of games, and all of these are coming May 29th for Switch. Uh, Borderlands The Handsome Collection, which is Borderlands 2 and the pre-sequel with all of their DLC. Borderlands Game of the Year Edition, which is the first one with all the DLC. Borderlands Legendary Collection, which is the Game of the Year Edition of the first one. Borderlands 2, and the pre-sequel with all the DLC. Bioshock Remastered, Biotox- Bioshock 2 Remastered, Bioshock The Collection, which is 1, 2, and Infinite with all single-player add-on content. Bioshock Infinite Complete Edition, which includes the DLC. XCOM 2 Collection, which includes the DLC. And Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition. So all that's coming to Switch on May 29th, so if you want to get all the Borderlands games uh, and the Bioshock games, I might pick up the Bioshock games because I never got into those, but I've been meaning to. And going on to what have I been playing, uh, more Rocket League, 
Uh, Double XP and Heat Seeker has been going on this weekend, so I jumped into that plenty. I finished Doom Eternal. That was a great game. Um, I love the combat flow and how fast paced it is. Uh, Marauders suck. Um, but the vast majority of the game is really fun. I love that game. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out what game to start next at this point. So this has been your update 5.4 for May 25th, 2020. Thank you so much for watching on YouTube or for listening on podcast platforms like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. If you want to get more frequent gaming news posts from me in between episodes, you can follow the show's page on Twitter at UpdateXShow. You can also give me any feedback or suggestions you have about the show while you're there. Outside of game news, I post gaming clips for fun on TikTok at The Only Rush. if you want to check that out. Another thing I did on TikTok is I got my Halo COVID-19 Relief t-shirt, and that came with a month of Xbox Game Pass Ultimate, which I didn't need because I already have it. So I did a, I don't want to call it a giveaway because I literally just posted it in my bio, the code for it. But when I get stuff like that that I don't need, I will post them on TikTok uh, more likely than anywhere else because that's where my biggest following is. And my personal Twitter page is also at the only rush where I post non-strictly news related stuff. As always, thank you so much for choosing Update X for your gaming news. I'll see you next Monday morning. Have a great week.